the National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh. Well, that's a warm reception if I ever heard one. I'm here at my post, Sam, ready to do my duty. All right, all right, let's have it. Have what? What have I done? Well... Come on, come on. Sam, who was that lady I seen you with? What lady? What lady? Sam, for your information, there was a five-column picture on page one of the Chronicle showing you with your arms around... The redhead. Yes. Ah. It means nothing to me as a person, Sam, although I am a redhead myself, but I feel there are certain standards of publicity and... An agency of our stature. Angel, Angel, if you'd bother to read the caption under the picture, you would have learned that my arms were around this other redhead to keep her from braining me with a paperweight she picked off Dundee's desk. Oh. Yes. So take my picture back out of the drawer, and while you're at it, grab the book and pencil, because I'll be right down with a somewhat lengthier explanation entitled The Sinister Siren Caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, a red-headed woman made a fool out of me. Effie! Miss Perrine. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. I was just... Well... What a pleasant surprise. Oh? No black eyes. Not what? Hair comb, suit dress. Yes, frayed, frayed, but tidy. How do you explain this, Sam? Well... I'm so used to you coming in with... <laughs> Battle scars? Uh-huh. Among other things. How do I explain this? That woman is a cue if I ever heard one. Are you, uh... Ready, Sam. That's all right. That's my girl. To Mr. Donald Stryker, Bellhaven Apartments from Samuel Spade. License number 137596. Subject, the sinister siren caper. Dear Donald, business was terrible and I blamed the weather. Sitting in my office with my feet on the radiator and the paper on my lap, looking out on the 48th consecutive day of rain, I was seriously contemplating moving my place of business to a warmer climb where people could get out in the sunshine and into trouble. The only item of possible interest in the paper was the story of the escape of one Artie the Actor, a convicted bank robber who apparently didn't much care whether or not it was raining when he busted out of the city jail. I had reached the part about some good friend and true smuggling Artie a set of keys when something prompted me to look up. And that, Mr. Stryker, is how I found you. Mr. Spade? Yes, sir. I am Donald O. Stryker. Mm -hmm. S-T-R-Y-K-E-R. Uh, the O stands for Oglethorpe, my mother's maiden name. Oh, well, that's nice. Sit down, Mr. Stryker. Thanks. Whew. Well, now, what can I do for you? Mr. Spade, the Strykers, as you may or may not know, are an ancient and honorable family dating back to pre-Elizabeth England, no. with the possible exception of one southern number who is said to have once nodded by mistake to Jesse James. Mm -hmm. No striker has run afoul of the law. Well, good for you. One and all, we have kept our skirts clean. One and all. Mm. That is why I am utterly at a loss to explain the situation in which I find myself. And uh, just what situation is that? A quasi-reliable source has informed me that I am a marked man. Quasi? Yes. Mm. Uh... Why don't you begin at the beginning, Mr. Stryker? The beginning, Mr. Spade, is only two minutes from the ending. Oh? Yes, it happened last night. I was sitting home with a book of Plato's dialogues when the bell rang most energetically. Mm -hmm. It proved to be a man named Strutt. George P. Strutt, S-T-R-U-T-T. -T. Two T's. A wild-haired, wild-eyed individual he was, Mr. Spade. Yes. Stryker, he says, Donald O. Stryker. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd hardly nodded when he grabbed me by the necktie. Ha, he said, just like that. Ha? Huh? Ha. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stryker, ha. I'm in time, then. You can still save yourself. And he shoved this at me. Oh, what's that? A picture of a girl, a young and rather pretty girl, out from a newspaper. Oh, yes. No name or identification. 
Beware this girl, Stryker, he said. Beware the siren song she sings. Stryker, he said, and he cinched up even harder on my necktie. Yes? Stryker, you are number six. I am five, and four are doomed before us. Beware, Stryker, beware this girl, this sinister red-haired harpy, this handmaiden of the dark angel. Well, that's quite a speech. A curtain speech, Mr. Spade. Mm. For with that, he let go my necktie and ran off down the hall. Somehow, somehow after that, Plato didn't seem quite the same. Yes, I see what you mean. Uh, do you know this girl? Never saw her before in my life. Or strut either? No. Mm-hmm. Mr. Stryker, I don't want to talk myself out of a job, but you don't need a private detective. Now, this is probably some harmless chap who walked out of one of the local sanitariums and took to ringing doorbells. But that's just it. He isn't, Mr. Spade. Huh? I did some telephoning this morning. Yes? He has a quasi-successful cigar stand downtown and an apartment on Leavenworth Street. His name is right next to mine in the telephone book. I... I, I must get to the bottom of this, Mr. Spade. I... I... Here. Here's fifty dollars. Well, Mr. Stryker... Are you completely skeptical? No. No. Just quasi. <laughs> And with that, we formalized our agreement on one of my quasi-legal contracts, and I promised to call you instantly if anything turned up and you departed, still in a quasi-quandary. Sticking the newspaper clipping into my wallet, I hopped a cab and went to Strutt's apartment on Leavenworth. Let's see, 26, 24, 22. Cloth on head, mop and tail beside her, testing the guarantee on Strutt's grand piano. Take it, Mr. Strutt isn't in. Nope. Who are you? Sam Spade, private detective. Detective? Yeah. Seems Strutt thinks someone is going to kill him. <laughs> oh, no. When did he dream that one up? <laughs> you got me. You know him very well? I've come here twice a week for 15 years. Well. You want to talk, Sam? You'll have to follow me around. Okay. Gotta get a wiggle on. Come on, y'all. Well, I'll get a wiggle on. You think, uh, you think he was dreaming it up, huh? Now, let me tell you about George Strutt. Yeah. Yep. Let me put that bucket down. Oh, please. Oh, there. Sorry. He is 68 years old, to my knowledge, and in them 68 years, one important thing has happened to him. He was born. Oh. George just reads too many cheap books, that's all. Well, no girlfriends? No. Well, no, wait a minute. Let me see. There was a woman about eight years ago in the bird watching club he belongs to, but uh, that laid an egg. Bird watching. Any enemies? How could a man like George have enemies? Nobody notices him. He matches the rugs. Now, look. He goes to lodge meetings twice a month, to church every Sunday. He doesn't smoke, drink, gamble, spit on the floor, or chase women. Uh -huh. Got no other bad habits. No car, no house, no money, no prospects. Yeah. Look out. I got to get into that closet. Oh, yes, sir. So why would anyone want to kill George Strutt? Been dead on his feet for 20 years. Why, when I see George, I'll give him a piece of my. <gasps> George! Oh. I turned in time to see him lean out stiffly, pause like a falling tree, and then topple to the floor. Followed closely by the cleaning lady, who must have agreed before she fainted that George didn't match the rug anymore. While this struck a false note in my mind, it explained the false note in the piano. The missing string was wound around his neck. I dragged her into the bedroom and managed to get her onto the bed by making two trips. Then I called homicide. 
The next order of business, per our agreement, was to call you, Stryker. So I got Strutt's telephone book, found he'd marked the page with your number on it with a slip of paper, which turned out to be the receipt for rent paid on a safe deposit box at the Golden Gate Bank. Now, this didn't seem especially important at the moment, but something else did. He'd made a circle around a group of six names in the phone book, marking each one with a check. Strubble, Strudwick, Strum, Strutterton, Strut, and Stryker. I postponed calling you for the moment and dial the number just above Strut. Strutterton, Harvey J., 156 Santa Ana Avenue, St. Francis Wood. Yes? Mr. Strutterton in, please. No. Uh, no, M Mr. Strutterton isn't in. This is his wife. May may uh, my name is Spade, Mrs. Strutterton. I'm a private detective. I, uh, I don't want to alarm you, but... Alarm me? Uh, do you happen to know if your husband has received any threats recently? Why, not that I know of. Any contact with a strange young woman about 30, red hair? Why are you asking me this? Well, I'd rather not say until I know more about it. What about the girls? Yes. Yes, he, he did meet a girl like that. Oh, when? She, uh, she came to the door one night about a week ago. Said her car was stalled down the street a ways. Harvey went out to help her. They were gone about a half hour, and then he came back. Well, did he tell you anything about it? No. Just that he'd gotten her started. Uh-huh. Is he a mechanic, or...? He was a lawyer. Was? Harvey is dead, Mr. Spade. His car crashed through a rail on the Skyline Boulevard night before last. Burned up. I just been to San Mateo to identify the body. Strom Joseph P., 828 Howard Street. Yeah, yeah, that's Joe. That is your beer. Thanks. You know Joe pretty well? I might, and I might not. Why? What do you mean you might not? This is 828 Howard Street, isn't it? The number's over the door. Don't you like me, Barton? What's eating you about, Joe Strom? Look, you see this? Mm, private detectives like... Oh. Yeah, yeah. Poor but honest, Barkey. Trying hard to get a little cooperation. I thought you was a cop. Now, uh, what's with Joe? Well, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he uses the phone here. He makes a little book now and then in the back room. Nothing wrong, you understand, but still and all, there's nothing a guy likes to blat around about the strangers, you know. Yeah. Any idea where he is now? Well, that's a pretty hard thing to say where Joe is at any given time. Oh. Even when Joe's acting normal, which at present he isn't. Oh, why not? Well, like all bookies, Joe does not have a heart. But if he had one, I would not hesitate to say Joe was in love. With a red-headed dame about 30. How did you know? Yeah, look at the picture. Well, uh, let me get my glasses. Uh, oh. Glasses, glasses, glasses. Yeah. There they are. Uh, oh, ho, oh, aha. Uh -huh. This is the dish. Mm. You uh, know her name? No. Joe has made no formal announcement as yet, but the way it has gone around, he is giving eight to five, he will marry her. Which, for Joe, is a sure thing. Mm. Uh, last Friday it was when I'd seen him last. They sat up to the bar here, and the two of them talking at some length about things I have never heard Joe discuss before. Like what? Well, as I said, bookies are different from people, so it should have not surprised me that Joe and his wren were not discussing rose-covered cottages as do most boys and girls when they reach the loony stage. Yes. From what I could gather as I pass by now and again, serving the other customers, Joe and his girl were discussing a cozy little rose-covered safe deposit box. Mm-hmm. And you haven't seen either of them since last Friday, huh? No, I have. Oh, I'll be right with you. Yeah. Global Leaf Buffet, Charlie talking. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? You don't say. When? This morning, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure, I will. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Hey, you, uh... You wouldn't know a bookie who might be casting about for a phone, would you, pal? What happened to Joe? Body washed ashore on Baker's Beach this morning. That was the morgue. I know what...
what you mean, Sam. Marks, abrasions, contusions, indications of foul play. That's right, Maxine. Did you see the police surgeon's report? Yeah. Shot a dope and shoved into the briny. Person or persons unknown. Well, pretty hard to do by yourself, huh, Sam? Yeah. Oh, you wish to look on Joe Strom, I take it. Yeah, yeah, this is it. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, no, this is the wrong one. This is Strudwick. Wait a minute, Strudwick. Strudwick. Anthony P. Are you known, Sam? Yeah. 28 Genoa Place, Bayview 72118. Nice looking boy, they said. Mm. Friend of yours, huh? No, no. Huh? Well, then how did you... Brand new league I'm in, Maxie. We call the shots ahead of time. Now, what about Strudwick? Old artist. Lived on Telegraph Hill. Got drunk three nights ago. Walked out his studio window on the fourth floor. All alone at the time. Well, if anyone offers you odds on that, grab it. See you later, Maxie. Yeah, but ain't you going to look on Joe Strom? No. Well, it's up to you, Sam. So long, Strudwick. Top man on the totem pole was James A. Struble, a barber who lived on 18th Avenue. I called, no one answered. So I made what by now had become the obvious deduction. I went to headquarters and checked the homicide reports, likewise the accident files and the traffic details. Surprise. No James A. Struble. So I switched abruptly from the S's to the D's and called on dear, patient, understanding Lieutenant Dundee. Who's going off half cock? You. If you weren't such an idiot, you'd see what I'm talking about. No, listen, Sam, I'm no green pea. I've been kicking around homicide for 30 years. Long enough to know you got to have a motive to build up a case. Yes. How can you stand there and tell me a red-headed dame opens a phone book, draws a ring around six names, and then runs out quick and knocks them off? I didn't say that. Ah, uh, and why do you want me to put out a general pickup on James A. Struble? Because if he isn't dead right now, he will be. Oh, uh, the dame? Dundee, no dame could strangle a six-foot man like Strutt with a piano wire. She's working with someone. Sam, I love you, believe me, but try to see my side, will you? So I put out a general on Struble, and we pick him up, and he screams. And the chief hauls me in to ask why. And I tell him we put the pinch on Struble because his name is ticked off in somebody's phone book. Why? Yeah. Hey, who are you? Lieutenant. I want to see the lieutenant. Hey, is he drunk? I'll ask him. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, what's your name? Struble. James A. Struble. I want to report a murder. Well, who? Me. That's the last we got out of him. Ten seconds after he hit the floor, he was dead. A thirty-eight slug had taken him just under the left shoulder blade, and instinctively, Dundee grasped the point. A squad car was dispatched to your office, Mr. Stryker, to pick you up and stow you safely in the poke when I checked out. <laughs> listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and very unpredictable Tallulah brings you another gala broadcast of the big show. Among Tallulah's guests for this Sunday's big show are Fred Allen, Eddie Cantor, Bill Baker, Eddie Fisher, and many, many more. It's an hour and a half of the very best in comedy, music, and drama. Every Sunday, it's the big show on NBC. For drama this Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents the heartwarming play Genie, starring Barry Sullivan and Margaret Phillips. <laughs> Now back to the sinister siren caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The next move looked like a tedious one. To take the clipped out picture of the redhead and try to identify her by matching it up in the files of one of the town's four newspapers. I'd gone a half a block when someone saved me the trouble. It was the bartender. Sam, I got news for you. Uh, where can we talk? How about the Blue Fox? Okay, uh, I'll meet you there in five minutes. Wait a minute. Why can't five we talk minutes. here? Five 
Cheers. Yeah. Oh. <coughs> <coughs> sorry, Sam, sorry. Well, you're in sad shape, bartender. What happened? The redhead. Hmm? Joe Strum's girl. She was in. When? An hour ago. She was loaded to begin with. And when I poured her a couple of stiff horns on the house, she begun to talk. Oh? Sam, crime is rampant. Yeah? For instance? Well, from what she told me, Joe Strum was dwelling in a fool's paradise. Yeah. Much talk, many promises, and an occasional smooch. But when the score is added up, Joe never gets past his own ten-yard line. Whose girl was she? Whose girl? <clears throat> Prepare for a jolt, Sam. I'm holding onto my chair. Artie the actor. Artie the actor? Artie the actor. The picture you showed me was taken at his trial. Yeah. She was sitting right behind his lawyer. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The safe deposit box. Yeah? How much is Artie supposed to have stashed away? She told me. A solid half million bucks. Now, numerous insurance officials and a hat full of private dicks are openly curious as to what happened to the dough. Yeah. And the ranks of the curious have just been joined by Artie himself since he busted out of the jug. No dough? The cupboard is bare. Mm. Why'd he take the box out in Joe's name? She says Artie's a whimsical type guy. Whimsical. You know what he does? What? He flips the phone book open when they pull into town with the dough and picks himself five names in five banks. Six names, you mean? Nope. Five, she says. Mm -hmm. Well, Stryker was in. Huh? Never mind, never mind. So Artie figured with the money in five different legitimate names, it couldn't be traced to him if, it, if he got tapped, huh? Which he does get. Tapped and convicted besides. Mm. Now, the dish looks upon Artie as in the deep freeze and hustles around to each of the five guys with a proposition. So? Artie becomes wise to this and takes them up in order when he busts out. Mm. Uh, cheers. Yeah. <coughs> this much, this much I learned before she staggers out of my joint. Mm. The rest I must leave for you to figure. <coughs> you uh, can't drink, bartender. Occasional. Mm. Uh, Sam. If there is any other reward, though, floating around when the smoke settles, I will be at the Cloverleaf. It's uh, only beer, you know. And if you run across an honest, hard-working book who needs a phone... Yeah, thanks a lot, Charlie. So long, <laughs> Charlie wiped the froth off his chin with a napkin and took off. I let him have a healthy lead, then tailed him. It was quite a tour, too, into the morgue, across the street, out the Kearney Street door, then onto the California Street cable car, and up Knob Hill to the Fairmont Hotel, where he hustled into a yellow cab number 462 and drove off. And waiting for him in the cab was the red-headed dame. There were no other cabs around to follow him, so I waited a half hour until he got back, waved a bill under the driver's nose, and climbed back on the merry-go-round. He let Charlie out at his own place, the Cloverleaf, and then driven downtown to a flea bag called the Shoreside Hotel on the Embarcadero, where he left the redhead. I woke up the desk clerk and shoved the redhead's picture under his nose. Well, let me see, let me see. Seems like... You recognize him? Sure. Clara Bow. Clara Bow, the movie queen, ain't it? <laughs> Don't win anything. Look, friend, she was just here. Clara? The girl here. Oh, ain't she ain't Clara Bow? Right, right, she ain't Clara. She just drove up in a taxi, and... Well, don't see you as good as I used to. You, you, you see, the glasses hurt my nose. Look, she just drove up in a taxi. Did you see her come in? No, no, no. I I must have been dozing away. Yeah, yeah. I seen her come out, though. Huh? Yeah. Her and Mr. Walker checked out 15 minutes back. He was in 26 upstairs. <laughs> I didn't have to cross-examine the clerk to see Mr. Walker had lived in 26 for some time. The floor was ankle-deep in cigarette butts, liquor bottles, sandwich crusts, and other debris. A table in the corner was covered with travel folders, mostly on South America. And seven days' newspapers, the top one of which was turned to the story on Artie the Actor that I've been reading in my office this morning when it all started. You know, it's too bad you came in when you did, Stryker, because if I'd read one more paragraph, I'd have learned something that could have saved me a lot of trouble. Whatever was the case with four of the names, the fifth one, Artie hadn't picked at random. His lawyer was Harvey J. Strutherton. Hello? Mrs. Strutherton, this is Sam Spade. Oh, Mr. Spade. Yeah. Thank heaven you called. I'm terribly frightened. What's the matter? The girl. The redhead? Yes, yeah, she just called me. She says, she says my husband was murdered. One of his clients, a man he defended, thinks Harvey betrayed him. Artie the actor, Artie Billing. Yes. 
There was a lot of money. She knows where it is. Why is she telling you all this? I don't know, Mr. Spade. She warned me against calling the police. I don't know what to do. Well, then don't do anything. But don't you see? She's coming here. She'll be here in 20 minutes. I made it in 15. Left the cab a block away and walked down Santa Ana Avenue to number 156. The night fog had moved in, making it tough to follow the path through the high shrubbery to the door of the house. Mrs. Strutterton hadn't helped matters any by turning out every light in the joint. Mr. Spade? Yeah, yeah, she hear you? No, no, come in, come in. Why don't you turn out the lights? I thought I was being watched. There's a fire in the living room, this way. The shades and draperies were all pulled. The windows shut tight. The house had the musty reek of a room that's been closed up for a long time. She guided me around the dining room furniture and through the doors into the living room, sat me down in front of the fire. Would you like some brandy, Mr. Steve? No, thanks. Cigarette? Yeah. Thanks. Tell me now. Tell me. I want to know everything. This man my husband defended. You know he's out of jail? I saw the papers. Why would he kill Harvey after my husband did everything in his power to get him acquitted? Money. A lot of money. How much? A half million dollars. Oh. How about a match? Oh, yes. I held back, and without thinking, she leaned over into the firelight. I saw Mrs. Strutterton then for the first time. It was the redhead. <laughs> All right, hold it. Now, don't move. What are you this doing? This is a 38 baby at the back of your neck. Now, don't move. All right, where is he? I don't know what you mean. You heard what I said. Where's your husband? He's dead. He's the dead. The body you identified in San Mateo is already the actor. You and Harvey engineered the escape, so you'd have a fall guy for five murders and 500,000 bucks. Now, for the last time, where is he? Harvey. All right. Harvey. You'll kill me. <laughs> don't, Spade, don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. I didn't have to. A few months hence, the state of California will do it the legal way. It was a long ride round Robin Hood's barn striker, but you wanted to get to the bottom of it, so there it is. Period. End of report. Well, Sam... What about the money? I'm still looking for it, If Harvey has thus far chosen not to talk, but Dundee hasn't really turned on the persuasion machinery yet. Who knows? Maybe he's opened the phone book at the P's and put his finger on Perrine, Effie. Oh, you don't even think of it, Sam. Uh -huh. I'll settle for $26.87, which represents the shortage in my check covering the period... Effie! What, 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 Sam? Can I believe my ears? What? Yeah. I look back upon the past 12 hours. How to keep our little organization together. To stave off the bill collector. Oh, I, I place my life in jeopardy. Tangled with a murderess. Use my poor, tired body as bait for her savage conspiracy. Sam, I'm sorry. Ferreting my way through morgue and crime-ridden alley to finally win the fight. And I... then... And then to come home I... expecting a cheery welcome. And to get instead scurvy I... innuendos and a bill for twenty six eighty seven. dollars Oh, forget it, Sam. Don't ever mention it again. I'm sorry. Well, that's my girl. Here. 10, 20, 5, 6, 7. 47 dollars. Now we're all square. Thanks, Sam. Thank now, you. Come here. <laughs> now you can bring me the 13 cents tomorrow. That's my boss. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> chimes mean good times on NBC.